Right, today I've come to the River Pang and it is freezing. I thought this would be very comfortable on a hot day, but no, my toes are frozen. So this is the River Pang uh, in Berkshire, just a little bit outside of, of Bucklebury. Uh, and this is one of my happy places. This is somewhere I've come uh, on many summer days. Uh, when I was little, I used to paddle in the Ford. Uh, when I was older, I used to come and paddle in the Ford. Uh, when I was at school, I came and did geography coursework here. Um, it is one of my happy places. The River Pang is a characteristic chalk stream. It comes off the chalk hills, meanders between them until it reaches Pangbourne, where it joins the River Thames. Uh, and it is often said that the River Pang um, was part of the inspiration for Wind in the Willows. We're actually a bit upriver of the area that, uh, that Kenneth Graham used to go to. That's um, a couple of miles further down. But it's here that you get the willow trees that are planted all along this section and uh, are probably quite loud in the microphone. Um, the River Pang itself was named after a person or a tribe uh, called Pega uh, back in uh, the Saxon period and it slowly became Pang. He presumably either owned the river or owned the land around it and it was his river. So. And so I don't have anything special to talk about today. The history of the river um, is pretty much just that. Um, but I decided I would come here and I'm going to read The Wind in the Willows while listening to The Wind in the Willows. So here we go. Chapter One, The River Bank. The mole had been working very hard all morning, spring cleaning his little home. First with brooms, then with dusters, then on ladders and steps and chairs, with a brush and a pail of whitewash, till he had dust in his throat and eyes, and splashes of whitewash all over his black fur, and an aching back and weary arms. Spring was moving in the air above, and in the earth below and around him, penetrating even his dark and lowly little house with its spirit of divine discontent and longing. It was small wonder then, but he suddenly flung down his brush on the floor and said, Bother! And, Oh, blow! And also, Hang, spring cleaning! And bolted out of the house with the even waiting to pick, put on his coat. Something up above was calling him imperiously, and he made for the steep little tunnel which answered in his case to the gravelled carriage drive owned by animals whose residences are nearer to the sun and air. So he scraped and scratched and scrabbled and scrooged, and then he scrooged again and scrabbled and scratched and scraped, working busily with his little paws and muttering to himself, up we go, up we go, until at last, pop, his snout came out into the sunlight and he found himself rolling in the warm grass of a great meadow. This is fine, he said to himself, this is better than whitewashing. The sun struck hot on his fur, soft breezes caressed his heated brow, and after the seclusion of the cellar which he had lived in so long, the carol of happy birds fell on his dulled hearing almost like a shout. Jumping off all his four legs at once, in the joy of living and the delight of spring without its cleaning, he pursued his way across the meadow until he reached the hedge on the further side. Held up, said an elderly rabbit at the gap. Sixpence for the privilege of passing by the private road. He was bowled over in an instant by the impatient and contemptuous mole, who trotted along the side of the hedge, chafing the other rabbits as they peeped hurriedly from their holes to see what the row was about. Onion sauce! Onion sauce! He remarked jeeringly, and was gone before they could think of a thoroughly satisfactory reply. Then they all started grumbling at each other. How stupid you are! Why didn't you tell him? Why didn't you say? Well, you might have reminded him. 
and so on in the usual way, but of course it was by then much too late, as is always the case. It all seemed to be too good to be true. Hither and thither through the meadows he rambled busily, along the hedgerows, across the copses, finding everywhere birds building and flowers buzzing, leaves thrusting, everything happy and progressive and occupied. And instead of having an uneasy conscience pricking him and whispering, Wait, wash! He somehow could only feel jolly. It was to be... He could somehow only feel how jolly it was to be the only idle dog among all these busy citizens. After all, the best part of a holiday is perhaps not so much to be resting yourself as to see all the other fellows busily working. He thought his happiness was complete when, as he meandered aimlessly along, suddenly he stood by the edge of a full-fed river. Never in his life had he seen a river before. This sleek, sinuous, full-bodied animal chasing and chuckling, dribbling things with a gurgle and leaving them with a laugh to fling itself on fresh playmates that shook themselves free and were caught and held again. All was a shake and a shiver, glints and gleams and sparkles, a rustle and swirl, chatter and bubble. The mole was bewitched, entranced, fascinated. By the side of the river he trotted as one trots, when very small, by the side of a man who holds one spellbound by exciting stories, and when tired at last he sat on the bank, while the river still chattered on to him, a babbling procession of the best stories in the world, sent from the heart of the earth to be told at last to the insatiable sea. As he sat on the grass and looked across the river, a dark hole in the bank opposite, just above the water's edge, caught his eye, and dreamily he fell to considering what a nice, snug dwelling place it would make for an animal with few wants, and fond of a bijou riverside residence, above flood level and remote from noise and dust. As he gazed, something bright and small seemed to twinkle down in the heart of it, vanished, then twinkled once more like a tiny star. But it could hardly be a star in such an unlikely situation, and it was too glittering and small for a glowworm. Then, as he looked, it winked at him, and so declared itself to be an eye, and a small round face began gradually to grow up around it. Then, as he looked, it winked at him, and so declared itself to be an eye, and a small round face began gradually to grow up around it, like a frame around a picture. A brown little face, with whiskers. A grave round face, with, ex with the same twinkle in its eye that had first attracted his notice. Small, neat ears, and thick, silky hair. It was the water rat. Then the two animals stood and regarded each other cautiously. Hello, Mole! said the water rat. Uh, hello, rat, said the mole. Would you like to come over? inquired the rat presently. Oh, it's all very well to talk, said the mole, rather pettishly, uh, he being new to a river and riverside life as it, and its ways. The rat said nothing, but stooped and unfastened a rope and hauled on it, then lightly stepped into a little boat, which the mole had not observed. It was painted blue outside and was white within and was just the size for two animals, and the mole's whole heart went out to it at once, even though he did not yet fully understand its uses. The rat sculled smartly across and made fast, then he held up his forepaw as the mole stepped gingerly down. Lean on that, he said. Now then, step lively. And the mole, to his surprise and rapture, found himself actually seated in the stern of a real boat. Uh, this has been a wonderful day said he, as the rat shoved off and took to the skulls again. Do you know, I've, I've never been in a boat before in all my life. What? cried the rat, open mouth. Never been in a... Where I get... what, 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 what have you been doing then? Is it, is it so nice as all that? asked the mole shyly, though he was quite prepared to believe it as he leant back in his seat and surveyed the cushions, the oars, the rowlocks and all the fascinating fittings and felt the boat sway lightly under him. Ice? It's the only thing, said the water rat solemnly as he leant forward for his trip. Believe me, my young friend, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, 
past so much worth doing as simply messing about in boats. Simply messing, he went on dreamily. Messing about in boats. Messing. Oh, look ahead, rat, cried the mole suddenly. It was too late. The boat struck the bank full tilt. The dreamer, the joyous oarsman, lay on his back at the bottom of the boat, his heels in the air. About in boats, I not with boats. The rat went on, composedly, picking himself up with a pleasant laugh. <laughs> In or out of them, doesn't matter. Nothing seems really to matter, that's the charm of it. Whether you get away or whether you don't, whether you arrive at your destination or whether you reach somewhere else, or whether you never get anywhere at all. You're always busy, and you never do anything in particular. And when you've done it, there's always something else to do. And you can do it if you like. But you'd much better not. Look here. Have you really nothing else on hand this morning? Suppose we drop down the river together and have a long day of it. <coughs> the mole waggled his toes from sheer happiness, spread his chest with a sigh of full contentment, and leant back blissfully into the soft cushions. What a day I'm having, he said. Let us start at once. Hold hard a minute then, said the rat. He looped the painter for a ring in his landing stage, climbed up into his hole above, and after a short interval reappeared staggering under a fat wicker luxury basket. So fat under your feet, he observed to the mole as he passed it down into the boat. Then he untied the painter and took the skulls again. Uh, what's inside it? asked the mole, wiggling with curiosity. There's a cold chicken inside it, replied the rat briefly. Cold tongue, cold ham, cold beef, pickled jackets, uh, skin salad, french rolls, Press and sandwiches, spotted tea, ginger ale, beer, lemonade, soda water. Oh, oh, stop, this is too much. <coughs> ah, ah, cried the mole in ecstasies. Do you really think so? inquired the rat, seriously. It's only what I always take on these little excursions, and the other animals are always telling me I'm a mean beast and cut it rather fine. The mole had never heard a word of say. Observed in the new life he was entering, intoxicated with the sparkle, the ripple, the scent, and the sounds and the sunlight, he trailed a paw in the water and dreamed long waking dreams. The water rat, like the good fellow he was, sculled steadily on and forbore to disturb him. I like your clothes awfully, old chap, he remarked after some half an hour or so had passed. I'm going to get a black velvet smoking suit myself one day, as soon as I can afford it. I beg your pardon, said the Mole, pulling himself uh, together with an effort. You must think me very rude, but all this is so new to me, so, so this is a river. The river, corrected the Rat. And, and you really live by the river? What a jolly life. By it and with it and... <coughs> God. The Rat's voice is quite painful. <laughs> by it and with it and on it and in it, said the Rat. It's a bother and a, it's a brother and a sister to me. And aunts, and company, and food, and drink, and naturally, washing. It's my world, and I don't want any other. What it hasn't got is not worth having. And what it doesn't know is not worth knowing. Lord, the times we've had together, whether in winter or summer, spring or autumn, it's always got its fun and its excitements. When the floods are on in February, and my cellars and basement are brimming with drink, that's no good to me, and the brown water runs by my best bedroom window, or again when it all drops away and shows patches of mud that smells like plum cake, and the rushes and weeds clog the channels, and I can potter about dry shod over most of the bed of it and find fresh food to eat, and things carelessly people have dropped out of boats. Uh, but, uh, but isn't it dull sometimes? The Mole ventured to ask. Just you and the river and, and no one else to pass a word with? No one else to... Well, I mustn't be hard on you, said the Rat with forbearance. You're new to it, and of course you don't know. The bank is so crowded nowadays that many people are moving away altogether. Oh no, it isn't what it used to be, oh no. <coughs> Otters, kingfishers, dab chicks, moorhens, all of them about all day long and always wanting you to do something. As if a fellow had no business of his own to attend to. Uh, what what lies over there? Asked the mole, uh, waving a paw towards a background of woodland that darkly framed 
the water mellows on one side of the river. Oh, that's, oh, that's just the wild wood, said the rat shortly. We don't go there very much, we river bankers. Aren't they, aren't they very nice people in there? said the mole a trifle nervously. Well, replied the rat, let me see, uh, <coughs> the squirrels are all right, and the rabbits, some of them, but the rabbits are a mixed lot. And then there's Badger, of course. He lives right in the heart of it. Wouldn't live anywhere else either, if you paid him to do it. Dear old Badger, nobody messes with him. They'd better not, he added significantly. Why, 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 why who should interfere with him? asked the mole. Well, of course, there are others, explained the rat in a hesitating sort of way. Weasels and stoats and foxes and so on. <coughs> They're all right, in a way. I'm, I'm very good friends with them. Past the time of day when we meet and all that, but they break out sometimes. There's no denying it. And then, well, you can't really trust them, and that's the fact. The Mole knew well that it is quite against animal etiquette to dwell on possible trouble ahead, or even allude to it, so he dropped the subject. A a and beyond the wild wood again? he asked, where it's all blue and dim, and, and one sees uh, what may be hills, or perhaps they mayn't, uh, and something like the smoke of towns, or is that only cloud drift? Beyond the wild wood comes the wide world, said the Rat. And that's something that doesn't uh, matter, either to you or me. Now, I've never been there, and I'm never going. Nor you either, if you've got any sense at all. Don't ever refer to it again, please. <sighs> now then, here's our backwater at last, where we're going to have lunch. Leaving the main stream, they now passed into what seemed at first sight like a little landlocked lake. Green turf sloped down to either edge, Brown, snaky tree roots gleamed below the surface of the quiet water, while ahead of them the silvery shoulder and foamy tumble of a weir, arm in arm with a restless dripping mill wheel, that held up in its turn a grey gabled mill house, filled with the air and the soothing manner of sound, dull and smothery, yet little clear voices speaking up cheerfully out of it at intervals. It was so very beautiful that the mole could only hold up it both forepaws and gasp, Oh my! Oh my! Oh my! <coughs> the rat brought the boat alongside the bank, made her fast, helped the still awkward mole safely ashore, swung out the luncheon basket. The mole begged as a favour to be allowed to unpack it all by himself, and the rat was very pleased to indulge him, and to sprawl full length on the grass and rest, while his excited friend shook out the tablecloth and spread it, took out all the mysterious packets one by one, and arranged their contents in due order, still gasping, Oh my! Oh my! at each fresh revelation. When all was ready, the rat said, Now pitch in, old fellow! And the mole was very glad to obey, for he had started his spring cleaning at a very early hour that morning, as people will do, <coughs> and had not paused for a bite or sup and he had been through a very great deal since that distant time, which now seemed many days ago. "'What are you looking at?' said the rat presently, when the edge of their hunger was somewhat dull, and the mole's eyes were able to wander off the tablecloth a little. <coughs> I, uh, "'I'm looking,' said the mole, "'at a streak of bubbles that I see travelling along the surface of the water. Uh, that is a thing that strikes me as funny.' "'Bubbles?' <laughs> Bubbles? Oh, ho! said the rat, and chirruped cheerily in an inviting sort of way. A broad, glistening muzzle showed itself above the edge of the bank, and the otter hauled himself out and shook the water from his coat. Greedy beggars, he observed, making for the provender. Why didn't you invite me, ratty? Oh, this was an impromptu affair. Uh, by the way, my friend Mr. Moe, <laughs> proud I'm sure, said the otter, and the two animals were friends forthwith. Such a rumpus everywhere, continued the otter, all the world seems now on the river today. <clears throat> I came up this back order to try and get a moment's peace, and then stumble upon you fellows. At least, 
I beg your pardon. I don't, I don't exactly mean that, you know. <laughs> there was a rustle behind them, proceeding from a hedge wherein last year's leaves still clung thick, and a stripy head with high shoulders behind it peered forth on them. Come on then, old badger, shouted the rat. <coughs> the badger trotted forward a pace or two, then grunted, <coughs> Company! and turned his back and disappeared from view. That's just the sort of fellow he is, observed the disappointed rat. Simply hates company. Now we shan't see any more of him today. Well, tell us, who's out on the river? <laughs> Toes out for one, replied the otter. It is brand new wager boat, new togs, new everything. The two animals looked at each other and laughed. Once it was nothing but sailing, said the rat. Then he tired of that and took to punting. Nothing would please him but to punt all day and every day, and a nice mess he made of it. Last year it was houseboating, and we all had to go and stay with him in his houseboat and pretend we liked it. He was going to spend the rest of his life in a houseboat. It's, <coughs> it's all the same. Whatever he takes up, he gets tired of it and starts on something fresh. Such a good fellow, too, remarked the otter reflectively. But no stability, especially in a boat. From where they sat, they could get a glimpse of the main stream across the island that separated them, and just then a wager boat flashed into view. The rower, a short, stout figure, splashing broadly and rolling a good deal, but working his hardest. The rat stood up and hailed him, but Toad, for it was he, shook his head and settled sternly to his work. He'll be out of that boat in a minute if he rolls like that, said the rat, sitting down again. Of course he will, chuckled the otter. Did I ever tell you that good story about the road and the lock keeper? It happened this way. Toad! <coughs> an errant mayfly swerved unsteadily athwart the current in an intoxicated fashion, affected by young bloods and mayflies seeing life. A swirl of water and a cloop and the mayfly was no longer visible. Neither was the otter. The mole looked down. The voice was still in his ears, but the turf whereon he had sprawled was clearly vacant, not an honor, otter to be seen as far as the distant horizon. But again there was a streak of bubbles on the surface of the water. The rat hummed a tune, and the mole recollected that animal etiquette forbade any sort of comment on the sudden disappearance of one's friends at any moment, for any reason, or no reason at all. Well, well, said the rat, I suppose we ought to be moving. I wonder which of us had better pack the luncheon basket. He did not speak as if he was frightfully eager for the treat. Oh, please, let me, said the mole, so of course the rat let him. Packing the basket was not so quite pleasant work as unpacking the basket. It never is. But the mole was bent on enjoying everything, and although just when he had got the basket packed and strapped up, he saw a plate staring up at him from the grass, and when the job had been done again, the rat pointed out a fork, which for anybody ought to have seen, and last of all, behold, the mustard pot, which he had the which had been sitting out without knowing it. Uh, still, somehow, the thing got finished at last, without much loss of temper. The afternoon sun was getting low as the rat sculled gently homeward in a dreamy mood, murmuring poetry things to himself and not much paying attention to the mole. But the mole was very full of lunch and self-satisfaction and pride and already quite at home in a boat, or so he thought, and was getting a bit restless besides and presently he said, uh, Ratty, please, I, I want to row now. The rat shook his head with a smile. Not yet, my young friend, he said. Wait till we've had a few lessons. It's not so easy as it looks. The mole was quiet for a minute or two, but he began to feel more and more jealous of rats, sculling so strongly and so easily along, and his pride began to whisper that he could do it every bit as well. He jumped up and seized the skull so suddenly that the rat, who was gazing over the water and saying more poetry things to himself, was taken by surprise and fell backwards off his seat with his legs in the air for the second time, while the triumphant mole took his place and grabbed the skulls with entire confidence. Oh, stop it, you silly ass! cried the rat from the bottom of the boat. You can't do it, you'll have us both over! 
The mole flung his skulls back with a flourish and made a great dig at the water. He missed the surface altogether, his legs flew up above his head, and he found himself lying on the top of the prostrate rat. Greatly alarmed, he made a grab at the side of the boat, and the next moment, sploosh! Over the boat went, and he found himself struggling in the water. Oh my, how cold the water was, and oh, how very wet it felt! How it sang in his ears as he went down, down, down. How bright and welcome the sun looked as he rose to the surface, coughing and spluttering. How black was his despair when he found himself sinking again. Then a firm paw gripped him by the back of his neck. It was the rat, and he was evidently laughing. The mole could feel him laughing, right down his arm and through his paw, and so into his, the mole's neck. The rat got hold of the skull and shoved it under the mole's arm, and he did the same by the other side of him, and, swimming behind, propelled the helpless animal to shore, hauled him out and set him down on the bank, a squashy, pulpy lump of misery. When the rat had rubbed him down a bit and wrung out some of the wet from him, he said, Now then, old fellow, trot up and down the towing path as hard as you can till you're warm and dry again, while I dive for the luncheon basket. <coughs> so the dismal mole, wet without and ashamed within, trotted about till he was fairly dry, <coughs> while the whack rat plunged into the river again, recovered the boat, righted her, made her fast, fetched his floating property to shore by degrees, and finally dived successfully for the luncheon basket and strolled to land with it. When all was ready for a start once more, the mole, limp and dejected, took his seat in the stern of the boat, and as they set off he said in a low voice, broken with emotion, Ratty, my generous friend! Uh, there's pigs in the next field, so I got distracted. Uh, Ratty, my generous friend, I, I am very sorry indeed for my foolish and ungrateful conduct. Uh, my heart quite fails me when I think how I, I might have lost that beautiful luncheon basket. Indeed, I have been a complete ass, and, and I know it. Will you overlook it this once and forgive me, and, and, and let things go on as before? <laughs> That's all right, bless you responded the rat cheerfully. What's a little wet to a water rat? I'm more in the water than out of it most days. <clears throat> Don't you think any more about it? And look here, I really think you'd better come and stop uh, with me for a little time. It's very plain and rough, you know, not like Toad's house at all, but you haven't seen that yet still. I can make you comfortable, and I'll teach you to row and to swim, and you'll soon be as handy on the water as any of us. The mole was so touched by his kind manner of speaking that he could find no voice to answer him, and he had to brush away a tear or two with the back of his paw. But the rat kindly looked in another direction, and presently the mole's spirits revived again, and he was even able to give some straight back talk to a couple of moorhens who were sniggering to each other about his bedraggled appearance. <laughs> when they got home, the rat made a bright fire in the parlour and planted the mole in an armchair in front of it, having fetched down a dressing gown and slippers for him, and told him river stories till supper time. Very thrilling stories they were too, to an earth-dwelling animal like the mole. Stories about weirs and sudden floods and leaping pike and steamers that flung hard bottles. At least, bottles were certainly flung, and from steamers, so presumably by them. <coughs> and about herons, and how particular they were about whom they spoke to and about adventures down drains, and night fishing with Offer or Otter, or excursions far afield with Badger. Supper was a most cheerful meal, but very shortly afterwards a terribly sleepy mole had to be escorted upstairs by his considerate host to the best bedroom, where he soon laid his head on the pillow and in great peace and contentment, knowing that his newfound friend the river was lapping at the sill of his window. This day was only the first of many similar ones for the emancipated mole, each of them longer and full of interest as the ripening summer moved onwards. He learned to swim and to row and entered into the joy of running water, and with his ear to the reed stems he caught at intervals something of what the wind went whispering so constantly among them. <coughs> and that is the end of chapter one of The Wind in the Willows. 
Um, it's out of copyright, so you can find it easily online. And uh, this is exactly the sort of little backwater where they would have had their luncheon. But considering in the text it's called the river and all of that sort of thing, it's likely that the river was meant to be the Thames and this, uh, the Pang, is the little backwater that they come off to. Uh, but the Thames doesn't really have many water rats anymore. And even on the river Pang, where they do still live, uh, they're very heavily endangered. Caught by domestic house cats, shot by farmers, all manner of things come to take them away. It's, uh, it's a very important conservation site. Being a chalk stream, it's extremely variable. We had a lot of rain over winter, so this is now actually a very high water level. Normally this is about six to eight inches deep around that. Something to paddle in. And yet I've been here when I came and did my geography coursework back when I was 15 years old. I've been here when it was completely dry. Uh, I've been here when it's been muddy and the river course is, is underneath the ground. But I have been here when it has been bone dry. And that's when the aquifers were almost entirely empty. And like many chalk streams, it has a variable source. It rises predominantly near Compton, but if the, if the water level is very high, which it is at the moment, the source can be in the village of Farnborough, another five or six miles away. And what people think of as, as dry ditches suddenly become the, the very upland of the, of the river. People come here to swim and paddle and enjoy summer. But today it is freezing cold. The water is freezing. The sun is nice and warm, but the water is frozen.